In this video, we're going to continue looking at problems from practice exam 2.2 2 .2 in the fall 22 semester, focusing on chapter 6 on thermochemistry. In this problem, we've got a dissolution of a solid in a liquid in water situation, and we're interested in figuring out the enthalpy change of dissolution for this solid. And we want to know it in kilojoules per mole of solid dissolved, so per mole of solid dissolved. And the problem mentions an ionic solid, but actually for the purposes of solving the problem, we don't necessarily even need to think of the solute as ionic. Um, we can think about it as some solute X in the solid phase going into aqueous solution. And this may seem like a very straightforward chemical equation, but I like to write it down to remind us that we want to know the enthalpy change when one mole of X is dissolved in water. And we have all the information we need to find this. We've got the volume of solution formed along with its density and specific heat, as well as the temperature change, and I'm going to highlight this in blue, this temperature decrease of 14.9 degrees C in this 149 milliliters of solution as the solid is dissolved. And the last thing we're going to use is the given mass of solid, which will allow us to figure out how many moles of solid we're dealing with here, along with the given molar mass. So tons of quantities here that you really want to kind of organize and, and sort through. But thinking carefully about how we proceed through the problem is going to help us here. So the first thing I would do, actually, is write a, a heat balance, write an equation that shows all of the relevant heat flows here and how they relate to each other we have a reaction taking place. We can think of the dissolution as a reaction, right? Bear with me here. And all of the heat of that reaction is transferred to or from the surrounding solution. And so the heat balance is Q reaction equals negative Q of the solution. Any heat flow that we observe via a temperature change in the solution came from or went to the reaction, the dissolution of the ionic solid. Right? And Q reaction, we know, well, that is equal to the total delta H. So I'm going to call that delta H tot at this scale we're dealing with here, right? At the 19.7 grams of ionic solid scale, we're going to divide that by the number of moles of solid to find the molar enthalpy change. But for now, we want to really dig in and, and focus on what's the heat released or absorbed by the solution. Well, we've got a temperature decrease of 14.9 degrees C, so delta T for the solution is negative 14.9 degrees Celsius. You want to be careful with the signs here. Temperature decrease indicates that the solution is cooling down. We know from the given problem and from the, the given data that the specific heat here is 4.18 joules per gram degrees C. And what is the mass of the solution? Well, just to save us a little bit of space on the slide, we've got 149 mils of the stuff, milliliters. We know its density is one gram per milliliter, and so we know that the mass is 149 grams of solution. So this is going to correspond to some quantity of heat. Now I'm, I'm actually going to take this quantity of heat and we'll just call it equal to delta H total. If we want the molar delta H, let's call that delta H sub M for per mole, we're going to take delta H total and divide by the moles of ionic solid dissolved. So the moles of X, let's call that N sub X. So to find that, well, I'm going to take my calculation from the previous line just to avoid intermediate numbers, move this over a little bit, I'm going to take my calculation from the previous line and just pop it straight down there. And then to find the moles of X, well, I'm given the mass of X, that's 19.7 grams. And I also know the molar mass of X, the mass of a mole, one mole, according to the information of the problem, weighs 78.2 to four grams. So that's going to give me moles in the denominator of this calculation. And finally, the very last thing to do, which is barely going to fit on the slide, is convert this from joules to kilojoules per mole. So we're in joules as a result of the joules right here sort of propagating through. To get this into kilojoules, we're going to 
divide by a thousand. And so we can think about this as in the denominator multiplying by 1000 joules per kilojoule. And after that unit conversion and plugging and chugging away, we arrive at a delta H of positive, and the sign is key, 36.8 kilojoules. Oh, sorry, 36.9, rounding properly, 36.9 kilojoules per mole here. And the positive sign is important and could be intuited from the fact that the solution decreased in temperature when the dissolution took place. So the reaction, if you like, or the dissolution process is endothermic, meaning the enthalpy change is positive. That also shakes out of the signs. Negative Q solution. Q solution is a negative number. A negative times a negative is a positive. So there you go. In this problem, we're asked to determine delta H for the reaction below from the given delta H's of the two reactions below our target. So I'm going to call this reaction, reaction three. Reaction three is our target. Reaction one has a known enthalpy, and reaction two has a known enthalpy. So the idea here, we're going to apply Hess's law. If we look at the reactions, it becomes apparent that we have all of the reactants and products, all the chemical species we need in the two given reactions at the bottom to construct the third from them. Um, assuming everything cancels and all that good stuff, which of course it will because the problem is constructed as such. And to get started with these Hess's Law problems, I always look for reactants or products that only show up in one of the series of known reactions. So for example, SbCl3, if we highlight that in orange first here, that shows up only in reaction two. And it's on the reactant side in reaction two, exactly where we need it, and it's at the scale we need, one mole of SbCl3 in the target reaction and one mole in reaction two. And so in thinking about how to construct reaction three from the other two reactions, I appear to, to satisfy the SbCl3 sort of requirement to put SbCl3 where it needs to be at the right scale. I just need one copy of reaction two. What about the SB and the 1.5 Cl2 on the product side? Well, here again, if I just look at um, SB, I've got antimony on the product side to the tune of one mole. Here I have antimony on the reactant side to the tune of one mole in reaction one. And so to get antimony on the product side, what I need to do is negate reaction one which corresponds to flipping the reactants and products, right? If I flip a reaction, I negate the sign of its enthalpy change, and you can think about that as multiplying all the stoichiometric coefficients by negative one, in a sense, with the reactant coefficients negative and the product coefficients positive. All right, at this point, we're done, and here it's very easy to verify that Cl2 is at the right scale. So upon flipping reaction one, I've moved these 2.5 Cl2s over to the product side, right? And I have one Cl2 on the reactant side in reaction number two. So with one on the left and 2.5 on the right, overall I have 1.5 on the right, which is exactly what I need to have to complete the target reaction. And so, yes indeed, we have successfully constructed reaction three from reactions one and two. And at this point, to apply Hess's law, all we need to do is replace the reactions themselves with their corresponding enthalpy changes. Delta H3, which we don't know, well, that's equal to delta H2 with the given sign, negative 80 kilojoules, minus the enthalpy change of reaction 1, which is negative 394 kilojoules. So that's going to flip positive and give us a final result of 394 kilojoules minus 80 kilojoules, which is positive 314 kilojoules for reaction three. So application of Hess's law, where we needed to flip reaction one in order to make this work. But after flipping reaction one and adding the two enthalpies, we arrive at the enthalpy of reaction three. In this question, we're asked to determine how many kilojoules of energy are released or produced when 531 grams of octane are combusted according to the thermochemical equation below. So it's all about thermochemical equations and applying heat 
as a kind of stoichiometric reactant or product, depending on whether the reaction is endo or exothermic. Here, thinking about combustion, we're definitely dealing with an endothermic process, and so it's no surprise that the enthalpy change shows up on the product side. This is an exothermic reaction, and the enthalpy showing up there tells us that. We don't necessarily need to know that, but it's a useful thing to notice. And that quantity of heat corresponds to the reaction on the molar scale as it's written right here. So for every two moles of octane, let me highlight that too, for every two moles of octane that are consumed, we get 5,000 or so kilojoules of heat released. Okay, and we can use that like a molar ratio, right? And this is the beauty of thermochemical equations. Now I can set up a molar ratio with this quantity of heat in the numerator and two moles of octane. And moles is actually worth writing here. Thermochemical equations are on the molar scale. That's worth noticing. This is a molar ratio I can now use in calculations. And notice, I'm given a quantity of octane, right? And so I can immediately say, all right, that 531 grams of octane, well, that's not going to work directly, but if I can convert that to moles, well, then I'm in business, and I can do that conversion using the molar mass of octane, which is given here. It's 114.2. 2.32 grams in one mole of this stuff. So at this point, we can plug and chug and calculate the heat released by this quantity of octane when it's fully combusted. And when I plug in the numbers, I arrive at a final heat value of 11,800 or so kilojoules. And notice we were already in kilojoule world with the initial thermochemical equation, so no unit conversions are required here. Definitely useful to pay attention to those units because this is a very, very large quantity of heat, right? So you may be inclined to divide by a thousand, but that's not justified here because we started out in kilojoules, and notice we're combusting about five moles of octane, so it's no surprise that this is a very, very large number.